Welcome to this May Day edition from Union Solidarity International. We're absolutely delighted to be joined by our great friend and comrade, Yanis Varoufakis, who is actually in Texas at the moment, joining us live as he is there visiting Professor James Galbraith, another contributor to USI. Yanis, it's a pleasure to have you with us, comrade. The pleasure is all mine, comrade. Good. Well, on May Day, let's start off with some of the very good news that is going around at the moment, Yanis, that being unemployment. And of course, that is not good news at all, because as we have seen over the last 48 hours with the, the recent economic and job data, unemployment continues to rise absolutely worryingly, and very, very worryingly, on youth unemployment at nearly 38% across the whole of the Eurozone, but at 60% in your own country. We've also seen inflation barely getting beyond zero at 1.2%, and with the European Central Bank talking about reducing its interest rates even lower. But what that will do in the current situation, you know, we will leave to you to try and answer, Yanis. It's a very, very depressing picture, and in terms of an economic stimulus, even with a rate cut, it doesn't seem that that will make any difference. And the press recently have been describing the Eurozone as actually approaching a deflationary situation. Yanis, can you just recap where we are? Andrew, is it not interesting that we could have been having this conversation in 1930, verbatim, word for word. Everything you just said, we, it could have been lifted out of a conversation uh, in 1930. We have um, a labor market which effectively has failed. Not only is unemployment increasing uh, or remaining very high in countries like the United Kingdom, but also you have a shrinkage of uh, the active labor force, the people who are seeking work, which means, as we all know, in economic parlance it's called the discouraged worker effect. People effectively losing hope and dropping out. And at the same time, we have um, contagion. This situation, the spreading of uh, the malaise and that afflicts labor market, uh, markets all over the world is going from one country to the other, from one block to the next. In the United States, uh, they've been celebrating some recent falls in unemployment. But if you look at the number of people employed or the percentage of employed people in the United States going down, unemployment may be falling only because the people who are looking for jobs and hopefully looking for jobs uh, is declining. At the same time, very same time, you mentioned it, central banks are thinking of pushing interest rates lower just in order to arrest this free fall. Lower than what? Zero? That's the liquidity trap that John Manion Keynes described so vividly in 1936. They are caught in that trap. They cannot reduce the cost of borrowing. And anyway, as we all know from the 1930s, when our economies are caught in that spiral, that deflationary spiral. Um, you can push interest rates to precisely zero. Businesses are not going to invest. Businesses are sitting on a pile of cash which they are not energizing, mobilizing in the form of productive investments because they fear that there will be no demand at the end of the production line for the goodies that we produce using this money. And this fear is self-confirming. It's a self-confirming prophecy. And we're all steadily sinking uh, deeper and deeper into this, this mire. The only thing that would stimulate this, this kind of uh, uh, economic negative, uh, destructive juggernaut is a, a massive investment-led recovery program, which is not happening because the political class in power, um, class warriors that they are, are far more interested in ensuring that their tax rates are low 
and that they do not have to backstop any such investment in the recovery program. So it's not happening. Um, in the 1930s, we got out of it because the investment-led recovery program took the form of a hugely destructive war. Now, well, we hope we don't have that kind of investment-led recovery program, but nothing short of that major sharp shock to capitalism would help it revive, but it's not coming. It's not coming, Yanis, and we've been speaking about this for a number of years now, you know, ourselves, uh, with you know, trade unions in the UK and with Union Solidarity International. And in previous conversations with other fantastic economists like Steve Keane, they have spoken about, and I know you've referred to this in the past as well, Yanis, that policymakers seem to understand the gravity of the situation, but yet will not change course. It's as if they realise that they're in a car heading for a wall, they have the brake to stop them hitting that wall, but they're not going to apply it, all because of ideology and politics. You've explained that what is required is a major stimulus, not only in the Eurozone, but in America. We see efforts by the Japanese government at the moment as well, trying to provide a stimulus to their economy. And it just isn't going to be enough in the time frames that are required to arrest this unemployment situation in particular before it really explodes. Do you foresee anything changing at all, Yanis, or are we on this downward spiral? In short, I don't see any political move that uh, is going to apply with those breaks that you mentioned. Nothing good is going to come out of our present circumstances if uh, the trade unions, organized labor, sensible human beings around the world do not conspire and congregate with a view to push our policymakers into fearing us more than they fear them. Uh, let, me, let me, however, take a slightly different position regarding what policymakers are up to. It is not clear that policymakers understand that which is necessary in order to jolt capitalism out of its downward spiral. Some do. In particular those are transnational organizations like the International Monetary Fund. They have started waking up to the new realities. But then you have uh, parochial politicians like the Chancellor of Germany and the opposition, the SPD <laughs> party in Germany. Uh, you have Mr. Osborne in London, you have uh, the Greek government, you have petty little parochial uh, um, masters, uh, who are not really masters, they're in, in, in government, but they're not in power. And each one of them it has a very short-term horizon. Each one of them worries about the next local government election, the next elections, the next opinion poll. So if you have an over a, a glass of sherry or whatever it is that they drink. If you have a, a conversations about, a, a, you know, an intellectual conversation about capitalism, you could possibly persuade them that we are right, that you and I and what we are saying are right. But when they will step back into their office, they will have their own short-term agenda. And let's not forget, they have sponsors that they need to please. And those sponsors are absolutely uninterested in the collective good of their own class. This is what Karl Marx has always uh, described as the malaise of capitalists. They are not even good at mapping out a path that would be optimal for the capitalist class, for capitalist accumulation. And let's not forget, because you know, people like me, for instance, you know, we evoke John Maynard Keynes often, even though I'm a left-wing Marxist, right? He wasn't a left-wing Marxist. He was not about bringing about the socialist world. He was about saving capitalism from itself. And he was knocking on doors at the Treasury. He was knocking heads together amongst his own uh, aristocratic um, social class, telling them, warning them about the perils that they were facing as a social class if they allowed 
these organized, orchestrated lunacy to go on. And they were not listening to him. Similarly, when there are smart, rational, bourgeois um, minds, like Paul Krugman, New York Times, or Martin Wolf, writing for the Financial Times, who are not Marxists, they don't want to see the end of capitalism, just like Keynes, they want to see the restoration of capitalism. And yet they're being denigrated and belittled by all those pseudo-intellectuals, journalists, politicians, who are effectively doing their utmost to represent what they consider to be the views of the powerful, of the high and mighty. So we have a complete coordination failure here um, on the part of the capitalist class and those who represent it. They're not at all clever at pursuing their collective interest. Uh, they're like, you know, captains who are not interested in the shipworthiness of the vessel in which they travel. And this is why John Maynard Keynes, let me remind you, in a very similar uh, set of circumstances as the one that we find us, ourselves in now, had actually said that these captains of industry resemble the idiots on a sinking ship who will uh, not only fail to steer it uh, into a safe harbor, but they will even sink the, the lifeboats that are capable of bringing them ashore. So we have this great failure on the one hand. On the other hand, we have a left, a particularly a social democratic left, that sold out in the most disgusting and despicable manner back in the 1990s when they thought that they could avoid the class war and they could avoid arguments for redistribution of wealth from capital to labor, from industrialists to, to, to workers, simply by tapping into the fabulous profits of the financial sector, allowing financialization to run amok, and in exchange getting a few morsels with which to fund schools and hospitals. So once they sold their soul to the devil back in the 1990s, now it's very, very hard for the Labour Party in Britain, for the Socialist Party in Greece, for the socialists in, in Germany to turn against uh, that, that trend and to be critical of, an, of the financial sector, seriously critical, and at the same time return back to the game which once used to be called class struggle, demanding a higher cut for labor, which would stimulate capitalism, finally enough, which is what Keynes was saying, because Keynes was just a very clever supporter of capitalism, of course. And he thought that the best way that capital can reproduce itself is if it looked after demands on the part of the weaker members of society who will have to buy the goods and gadgets that uh, the factories are producing. So we have a wholesale failure, a failure on the right, on the capital, on the side of capital, a massive failure on the left. The only people who actually freak out at the mention of the two words class war or class struggle is the left these days. <laughs> Not the right, the right are class warriors. They really, they really know what the class war is about and they are conducting it brilliantly. Brilliantly, uh, energetically. So, in that mire, in that, in that situation, um, the only chance that we have is, uh, for some sense, sense, some rationality, some emotion to combine in order to create a solidaristic movement across borders for knocking some sense into a, any rational system. Yanis, thanks for that response. It's always great to get a, a class perspective and a Marxist perspective on May Day. Very, very pleased to, hear, pleased to hear those views. And actually, just to pick up on a phrase that you used, Janis, that I'm interested in pursuing with you in particular, the phrase being the sinking ship, which takes me to the euro itself. Now, I know that you have been a strong proponent of the euro, not in its current form, but if it was restructured and there was institutions that actually delivered investment to stimulate the economy, not the euro and its institutions as things stand. Of course, you've been very clear in your articulation of how you would like the euro and the European institutions to deliver for the people of Europe. However, bearing in mind what we just wrote, referred to about the lack of knowledge, you know, the lack of appetite for European politicians to take on board what you're saying. Are you beginning to entertain the thought that it might be 
a better case scenario for countries to leave the euro because as we know that and with respect to the UK there is a greater degree of economic freedom because they aren't within the eurozone at the present as time goes by do you personally begin to reevaluate your position that if the European powers that be do not change their position do not reform and introduce new institutions then leaving the euro is becoming a more likely situation for countries including your own that's a, such a an interesting question andrew okay first let me make it clear that i think the eurozone is a complete and utter disaster uh, and i only wish that my country had stayed out of it just like the the United Kingdom stayed at Arvid. But let's not give too many accolades to the Tories who kept Britain out of the Eurozone. They kept Britain out of the Eurozone for their own reasons. Yeah. It turned out to have been a very prescient <laughs> decision. Absolutely. Sometimes, you know, people can make the right decision for their own reasons. Um, so there's no doubt that we shouldn't be in the Eurozone. Greece, Portugal, Spain, Italy. It is crashing us. It's one thing, however, to say we shouldn't have been in. Quite another to say you should get out. Because by getting out, you don't go back to where you would have been had you never entered. You go to a different place. Absolutely. So the question is, how terrible or reasonably better to the present state we find ourselves in is this different place in which we'll find ourselves if we exit the Eurozone? Um, on that question, I'm beginning to change my mind mildly and subtly. So, for instance, my advice to the Cypriot government is that they should get out. They are way past the point of no return. They've already suffered all the costs of an exit from the Eurozone, with capital controls, with a loss of uh, huge bank deposits. Depositors were hit very badly, including companies that actually were very legitimate and did you know, good business and that had employees. Uh, so suddenly, you know, they may have had two or three or five million uh, euros in the bank, operating capital, capital was necessary to, for those businesses to function, suddenly so they've lost more than half of it. And the rest of it is even frozen. So they can't move it. So they, they can be no greater um, loss that a, a nation, a national economy can suffer. Uh, so they've suffered the, the, the cost of exiting the, the European monetary. They might as well now get out so that they don't have to report to the Troika every month about how much they, they spend on health and education. I'm, however, loath to say the same thing about my country, about Spain, Italy, and Portugal. We still would suffer a disproportion caused by exiting. What we must do, we must have a plan B. We must be ready for a possible exit in case this whole thing goes belly up. Um, and I'll tell you in a minute why I'm saying that. Have this plan B. And with this plan B in our back pocket, go to Brussels, go to Frankfurt, go to Berlin, and state our terms for staying in the EU. And our terms must be very simple. There must be an immediate banking union. There must be uh, an immediate mutualization of part of the public debt. And there must be a, a massive aggregate uh, investment project, something like the New Deal of Roosevelt's 1933. Sure. In. And if we have the plan B in our back pockets, it, the, the cost of doing that will be negative. It will be, it will be, there will be a net benefit from doing that. Now, I did say that before that actually I will explain why we definitely need a plan B. Because even if we are not prepared as social economies that are completely sort of asphyxiating under the, the austerity and idiocy of the Eurozone political masters, even if we are not prepared to do that, it is my considered opinion, and I've written about this on my blog recently, that the Bundesbank, the Central Bank of Germany, is actively campaigning to, for Germany to get out. So, if I'm right in this, I may very well be wrong, but I am convinced that I'm right. Uh, um, our peripheral, badly damaged 
economies must have a plan B to get out. Yanis, that's a, a very interesting response and I'd like to tease that out a little bit further because we are fully aware that the European powers that be and the institutions won't in the very near short to medium term time period take on board the sort of proposals that you are suggesting, Yanis. So in that environment whereby the European powers that be continue in the path that they're on, do you not feel that Greece in particular should be developing a comprehensive plan B to exit the Euro, even if the Bundesbank and influential people within Germany, their, their opinion doesn't come to the fore that you have referred to in your blog, that shouldn't Greece be doing something proactive in the knowledge that the European institutions won't take on board the advice that you're suggesting? Absolutely, absolutely. As I said, we have to have a plan B. Uh, the plan B is going to strengthen our um, negotiating power within Europe. But also, it would have, even if we don't activate it, Andrew, I think it would have beneficial effects, uh, even if not activated. Let me give you an example. Part of that plan B, as far as I'm concerned, should be a non banking payment system. By this, I mean an electronic way of where citizens can actually transact with one another and can transact with companies in euros, which is outside the banking system. Uh, see what happened in Cyprus, for instance, when the banks closed down for 10 days and the economy went to pieces. In Kenya, a fascinating experiment has proven utterly successful um, in allowing millions of people who didn't have access to bank accounts to use their mobile phones, prepaid mobile phones that are everywhere in Africa these days, to buy credit and then transfer that credit to companies or to other individuals, even to make payments to the state using an SMS text message. If the Bank of Greece with the Greek government support where to impose upon Greek mobile telephony companies or the ones that operate in Greece, like Vodafone for instance, since Vodafone is part of this experiment in Kenya where 60% of the population are transacting with one another using their mobile phones. If we can do something like that in Greece, um, suddenly there will be two possibilities. We will have two opportunities that we will currently lack and the plan B <laughs> waiting uh, on the side, on the margins. Okay, the two capacities we have is firstly, people will be able to transact without incurring banking costs and without us having to worry what will happen if banks, which are already insolvent in Greece, have been for a while, um, simply are thrown out of ELA liquidity provision by the European system of central banks, which is a major, it's the number one threat that Europe uses against the Greek government. Secondly, the Greek state could um, offer taxpayers the opportunity to buy what I call tax credits or tax coupons. So imagine that you go into a tax office or actually a news agent and like you buy a scratch card for the lottery, you could buy 100 euros of a tax coupon, which you can then um, use to next year to pay back not 100 euros worth of tax, but 140 euros worth of tax. So effectively by prepaying those 100 euros, you can, um, you can reduce your tax uh, next year by 40%, which is what large multinational companies do, but this time it will be citizens that will be able to do it. That way the government gets 100 euros today instead of having to worry about getting to next year. That gives the government um, more money to play with in order to you know pay for schools, education, soup kitchens, what 
edges, and you should be able to put on your mobile, mobile phone too, to transfer to other people. So that way you are creating a parallel electronic currency without the, bank, the banks being part of it. And the beauty of this system would be that unlike paper money, which is in euros, controlled by the European Central Bank, and you just could, you, you can't convert to drachmas at the top of a hat if you want to go to get out of the eurozone. In case we need to get out of the eurozone, this electronic payment system, all you need to do is, in order to convert it into a new currency, is flick a switch centrally at the central bank. So that would be your plan B. It would be an, a, a great weapon for the Greek government to have um, in its negotiations with Brussels, Frankfurt and Berlin, when they know that you already have a parallel currency system in euros. You are not out of the euro because all these tax credits and transfers uh, using mobile telephony will be done through in euros. But if need be, they can be switched like this. Thanks for that very fascinating response, Yanis. And I know that this is part of the appeal that has developed around the concept of the bitcoins as well, which I know you've refer to on your blog as well and although there may be issues regarding security around the bitcoins there is an interesting conversation beginning to happen about electronic currencies that can help uh, to deal with some of the issues that you're referring to uh, with the issue of the banks the lack of liquidity and their stability for that matter and just to pick you up on a point uh, in your answer there, which I found was fascinating, was of course Vodafone and paying taxes. Not two things that usually go together in the UK anyway with respect to Vodafone. So let's make sure let's make sure they're paying the Kenyan government the correct amount of taxes. But all joking aside, Yanis, I would just like to in my last question or two, move the conversation away from economics. I know this is your area of expertise. But I would like to talk about Greece and I would like in particular to talk about what is ubiquitously known as the deep state. Now we'll be having a, a web conference next week with Kostas Vaxifanis who is the lead person at Hot Dog, the person behind the Lagarde list and exposing the activities of other and let's be frank about this, corrupt individuals within the Greek state. Now, I would just like to tease this out a little bit further because I don't think people out with Greece really realise the deep level of penetration in the media, in the civil service, in the judiciary, in the military, of a nexus of power that is actually putting very high degrees of pressure on individuals to be silent like Costas. And I know that you went and on your blog published his letter of seeking assistance from people like yourself. I would, would you just like to comment on this issue, Yanis? Because I think it's absolutely astounding the nexus of the deep state that is within Greece going back to the junta. It's still very prevalent today. During the Occupy movement, demonstrations and gatherings in, outside St. Paul's, in, uh, at Wall Street, all over the world, um, we protested the banksters. This is a term that uh, actually quite, catches quite nicely the, the criminality of the financial sector worldwide over the last few decades culminating to the crash of 2008 and then the, 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 the significant human suffering that that has caused and is causing. However, this term bankster in Greece takes a much more literal sense in the sense that we have genuine gangsterism now on behalf of particular bankers. We have bankers in Greece. You see, the thing is that the more desperate the bankers are, the more the desperate the means that, that they deploy in order to secure their circumstances as they see them. So in London and in Wall Street and in Frankfurt, bankers 
effectively were bailed out by the state. The state was powerful enough to bail them out and to keep doing this and keeping them in financial power and in the manner into which they've become accustomed all those decades. Their profitability is back, they've kept their banks, um, and employment may be rising, but it's not their concern. So they, they can remain relatively civilized. They don't have to dirty their hands. They don't have to bloody their hands. They do not have to consort with killers in order to maintain their power. However, in Greece, for a couple of years, uh, the state did exactly the same thing as in Britain, as in Germany, as in the United States. The state kept them in financial power. It borrowed, even though the state, state was bankrupt, it borrowed from the Troika, it borrowed from the IMF, it borrowed from the German, it borrowed left, right and center to keep our bankers in power. Now, in doing this, of course, because the, bank, the Greek state was bankrupt, and after it had bankrupted the Greek society, and the middle class has been wiped out, there's nothing more to get from the Greek middle class, because that's it. They are now penniless. You have people that have very beautiful apartments in the expensive part of Athens and they are completely bereft because, you know, their apartment is empty, and they can't rent it, uh, they can't afford to live in it because they can't afford to, to, to pay the taxes. So the Greek taxpayer, middle class taxpayer, can no longer support those bankers. And they are fighting to the name not to lose control of the banks. And they're using mafia-like techniques. So, Banker A, I want to mention names because we don't want to go to the courts now. Uh, <laughs> Banker A is desperate to raise capital for his bank. Because otherwise the European, the, Euro, the Eurozone is going to take his bank away, given that this bank is receiving money from the European Union. Um, and this time it's capital, not just liquidity. So the Banker A needs to show that he's managed to attract private capital in order to keep himself as the chairman of the board of directors of the bank and the majority holder. But nobody's going to lend him money because everybody knows he is bankrupt and his bank is bankrupt and the state in which they live is bankrupt. So what he does is this. He sets up an offshore company in Cyprus or Cayman Islands or London for that matter and has Banker B, who is equally bankrupt as he, Banker A is, put money in that offshore company, lend money to that offshore company. And then Banker A takes that money and buys shares in his own bank. At the same time, Banker B creates his own offshore companies. And Banker A now lends to the offshore companies of Banker B, and Banker B uses that money to buy capital. So it's, you, know, you know the joke, there are two drunkards and uh, they have a bottle of, of, of wine and they try to sell it to make some money and one of them says to the other, hey mate, I'll give you a penny if you let me have a sip. And he gives him a penny. And the other guy says to the first drunkard, I'll give you a penny if you let me have a sip. And they keep doing this until they drink the whole wine. So this, the whole bottle of wine is precisely <laughs> what's happening. Yeah. Right? So yeah. they are hanging on for dear life. Uh, they, they are managing to retain control of their banks at the expense of the European taxpayers. And when journalists, some journalists um, from Reuters, from Greece, you mentioned Kostas Vaxavanis, probe that situation, suddenly they, are, they face initially a defamation campaign, a campaign to defame them, to pretend them as drug addicts, as uh, um, murderers, as uh, spies for the intelligence services, yeah, yeah. Uh, anything that will, will uh, reduce their credibility, as in, in case of uh, a journalist from Reuters, as a, an enemy of the state of Greece and its people and its history. <laughs> uh, also, and then at some point it seems that they became so desperate that they engaged uh, professional killers to wipe off the face of the earth particular journalists. My personal experience was that I received uh, death threats in the middle of the night, anonymous telephone calls, um, telling me to stay off the subject. That was about a year ago. Um, so I'm, this is something I know from personal experience. So just to, 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 to cut a, a long story short, when banksters no longer feel that their politician friends have the capacity to keep them in financial power, 
they will test tell desperate methods and increase those desperate methods um, moved into the realm of criminality and mafia-like behavior. But make no mistake, Andrew, if your bankers in the United Kingdom face this existen existentialist threat, it may very well come to the same result. Yanis, thanks for that response and for your honesty and, you know, quite frankly, your bravery, your bravery along with other individuals who have refused to stay off the subject and continue in various outlets across the world to get this message out to the widest possible audience and USI is just pleased to play a, a small part in being able to speak to people like you and Costas next week to get their stories out to a, a wider audience because what is going on in Greece in particular is nothing but a, an absolute outrage and daily abuses of human rights whereby the state quite often turns a blind eye to what is going on because it serves their own interests as well. Yaris, that leaves me but nothing to say other than thank you very much. I couldn't think of a better person to be speaking with on International May Day than your good self, comrade, and thank you for your continued involvement with Union Solidarity International. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Andrew. You asked me before what is it that the world can do to change. The answer is what you at USI are doing on an industrial scale.